It's Build 42 recap time. Let's start out with a list in no specific order. Animal husbandry, hunting, better farming, a fishing minigame, a rebalance of traits, professions, post-apocalyptic professions, and skills. A map expansion including retouching older parts of the map, a challenge map based on it being many years later, randomized wilderness on the edges of the main map, a tech tree based crafting system including different weapon parts with their own durabilities, and crafting machines aka workbenches, fluid transferring allowing for mixing of fluids, more items in general, some with uses, some for immersion, way more than you'd expect. A game engine update, which includes improved lighting, a new view cone effect, performance optimization, more Z-axis floors, 32 in total, either positive or negative, basically what's necessary for basements and skyscrapers. Better visuals, more immersive animations, a new dynamic music system that is more reactive to things other than fighting, ragdolls, a lot of UI touch-ups, a complete rework of guns, character voice and exertion sounds, Keys spawning realistically rather than by killing any random zombie inside a building. Customizable key rings? Profession houses. Cars being able to go up and down ramps. Role-playing theme changes. A lot of modding support. Better Discord integrations for server admins. Updated fires visually and mechanically. Well, uh, maybe there's a bit of sus with that last one. Listen, I'm not saying this is Zomboid 3.0, but it kind of is. Grab some snacks because I'm going to ramble about every detail I find worthwhile. I count at least 31 blog posts that discuss Build 42 over the last two years. I'm certain I've missed some. Yes, the Tectoid post that discusses promising performance updates intended for Build 42 was posted on February 3rd, 2022, more than two years ago at this point, and there is an earlier Build 42 post I know of. The Indie Stone has hired a substantial amount since the release of Build 41's multiplayer, and the pace of content creation has equally gone up. One thing to be aware of is exactly how new things are discussed. The Indie Stone is very open about discussing things while they are still in the idea phase. This has led to looping discussions on features. They first appear in a very early state, then sink out of sight for a while. They resurface once some more work has been done. This repeats over and over until they hit their polish phase, when nothing new has happened, so the feature is no longer mentioned. We are getting a very behind the doors look at game design. Before I get into this, everything I'm about to talk about is work in progress and may or may not happen, particularly anything mentioned in the earlier blogs. I'll try my best to put a source on screen, including the name of the blog I got it from. If you want a recap without having to listen to me for the next forever, the devs recently released their own recap in an upcoming features post. No, it was not a blog post, so I'm not sure how many people actually saw it. A link to that is in the description below. You should check it out as there's a ton of cool pictures to look at. All right, let's talk about animals as it starts with A. If we go all the way back to the Holy Cow dev blog of February 22, you'll find animals were not planned to be part of build 42. Instead, while planning the crafting aspects, they realized so much stuff will use animal products that it would be a mistake if they did not include them. So they decided to include animals with bare minimum AI in hunting as a minimum viable product. In a later dev blog called The Skillful Huntsman, we get a good view of hunting. There are handmade paths that a group of virtual animals will follow using a schedule. When the player gets close enough, they will spawn into the real world and return to being virtual if the player goes too far away. Even if the animals aren't there, the player will still be able to find evidence of their presence in the pre-made zones such as tracks, poop, and sleeping areas. This is very similar to how animals work in The Hunter Call of the Wild. That doesn't sound like a minimal implementation to me. Minimal would have been random animals walking around randomly in the woods. In this blog, they also talk about using the foraging skill or a potential tracking skill for hunting. Also, spooking animals is mentioned, but I'm not sure if this is a further into Build 42 aspect or beyond that point. As for husbandry, you will be able to capture and raise cows, sheep, chicken, and pigs. The other animals we've seen so far include rabbits, raccoons, wild turkey, and rats. It's unclear if you'll be able to raise any of those. As for raising animals, it's pretty simple and probably not worth talking about. There's pre-existing fences, barns, coops, and troughs all over the map if you do not want to build your own. You'll be able to leash found animals, put them in a trailer, and drive them to your farm. Fence them in, feed them, and water them. Okay, it's not that simple. There's plenty of teasers showing shearing sheep and such. It's the realistic gameplay you'd expect from Zomboid. I only have one question about raising animals. How long does it take them to grow? I wonder if we will have a realistic setting. Since so much of Build 42 is built around community play, I do wonder if server play in its accelerated timescale allows for proper realistic timelines. As long as an animal like a cow can be slaughtered for a realistic amount of leather, you wouldn't have to raise many to provide for a village or two. An in-game year only takes 15 real life days if your server is running the default one hour days and has a constant population. Beware though, they do mention keeping track of animals when the players are away in migration versus craft. So you better pay your neighbor to feed and water your cows while you sleep and work or they may not be alive when you get back. Enough of that. Next up is farming and fishing. Farming already exists in the game and it does have some mechanics but it's really not a satisfying or realistic system to partake in. Fishing on the other hand is straight up runescape from 2001. Simply standing there waiting for RNG to give you fish. You can fast forward it in single player to avoid the boredom 
But in multiplayer, without the ability to fast forward, it was clear it needed an update. Farming and fishing are mentioned as mini games in separate blog posts. Ending in a fishing mini game is pretty obvious, but farming as a mini game is interesting. While fishing might be a full time thing, Farming is probably meant to break up your gameplay with some peaceful tasks. Also, the devs are going very realistic with what you can catch while fishing, specifically looking to have all the correct fish for the area. Knowing where to catch what fish might matter for the crafting side of the game, but who knows. The fishing mechanics we know about so far are the visuals for when fish are in the area, which will be splashes on the water's surface. If you make a loud noise, fish will be scared away, and you can chum the water to bring some near. As for the actual minigame itself, they have shown it off on video, but we haven't got much detail. It's clear the rod is being controlled by the mouse. Not much else can be gleaned other than a generic line break meter. Farming, on the other hand, has plenty of detail available. They are going much more into realism with the new farming. In the blog Mr. McGregor's Garden, they mention expanding the sprites for farming to cover 15 crops and 8 herbs. That includes sprites for every plant in every situation, instead of reusing some for multiple different plants. Each plant will have a growing season, and you can expect to reduce yield when you grow them outside of that season. There will be other repercussions, such as disease and likely pests. You can find out their growing seasons by looking at the seed packets and special farming handbooks. By the way, this is the first time knowledge of in-game mechanics is being taught to the player in-game immersively. It might even be through a special tutorial handbook using that new Bink middleware they added. Bink lets them play videos and cutscenes for those who don't know. Wouldn't that be cool? Farmers and gardeners will know growing seasons from spawn, so there must be a way to tell the player even without the seed packets or books. Maybe a new page in the character menu. If you don't know why I'm mentioning this, Frapping in Build 41 has zero in-game explanation. You have to go to an outside resource if you want to know how it works. I assume the minigame part of farming will be caring for the plants. To aid that, they have mentioned adding contextual actions to reduce our need to right-click. Things such as holding a hoe in your hands, letting you make furrows with a key press, instead of right-clicking into the dig furrow menu. I imagine watering plants with a watering can in your hands will also exist in many more actions. While Zomboid does have some contextual actions, it really misses out on a ton of them. This new foray into them makes me very excited as it's not just farming getting them. As for the realistic bits of farming, we will now be able to dry peas and corn to use as seed next year and stick potatoes back into the ground to grow more. Herbs will be fast growing crops and you'll be able to harvest them multiple times as each time you harvest them, they will only be knocked back some growth stages in a similar way as strawberries currently work. You'll be able to propagate new herb patches with cuttings. Drying all sorts of plants will be a thing. There's a picture that describes it way better than words. By the way, this picture is probably one of the closest to finished new systems. The drying racks blend in so well to the existing game, it's like they have always existed. Most of the other new furniture and crafting stations don't really feel grounded like that farming gear does, which is to be expected as most of that stuff is work in progress. Next up is the map expansion. If you didn't know, there's a lovely website you can see the entire map on. I believe it's map.projectzomboid.com. I'll link it below. Anyway, if you check out the west side of the map, there's an obvious work in project zone. This area is currently in the game if you want to visit it. In Church on Sunday, they mention going over the existing older areas and giving them a polish too. A new tech upgrade is the ability for the map to go west and north from the origin point, something they couldn't do before. I think that will open up a lot of space for modders, but before modders start plunking down their new towns, the extra space will be filled up with some randomized wilderness. Now the devs very specifically state they will not be going full procedural generation with Project Zomboid. They believe a consistent map is necessary, but they do talk about a possible wilderness challenge map that is procedurally generated. I honestly agree with keeping a consistent map that people can actually talk about. I do however love the idea of a procedurally generated challenge map for those who have grown tired of the main one. Fun fact, if you go on the Project Zomboid YouTube channel, many years ago they showed off some procedural generation. Speaking of procedural systems, the crafting system, especially when starting on an empty map, will require some sources of ore. The new crafting system in Tech Tree is meant to carry someone from a starting stage, such as Naked in the Woods, up to something resembling a medieval village, a post-apocalyptic flavored one. There's two primary ideas behind the system. Provide a way for infinite play without wiping or respawning loot, and create community-based cooperation, such as trading. In Cellar Dordoid, they talk about the crafting system being the basis for a feature-rich in-game. Now, part of this is just giving you an objective beyond finding a hammer, saw, screwdriver, and sledgehammer. Once you found those in Build 41, the objective-oriented part of the game was done, and really you only need a saw and screwdriver if you're good. All you are left with beyond that point is survival. In Build 42, there will be tons of things to prepare for and eventually create. Whether that's scavenging the correct materials to skip farther into the tech tree, or grinding your way out of the Stone Age. It's your choice. Over time, the modern professions will no longer make sense, so new post-apocalyptic professions emerge. The main takeaway you should get from the incoming crafting system is immersion and role-playing. Crafting is very limited in Build 41. 
Even if you install the best crafting mods, they really had no footing to actually build on. In Build 42, they are providing a solid foundation for vanilla play and for modders to expand on. Yes, they are designing these systems with modding in mind. Now that we know about the goals of the crafting system, what will we actually be doing it? As I stated before, we will be able to skip tiers of the system via looted items if we want to. In the connection is made, the top tier of the tech tree is described as using mills to power other machines and workstations. Machines and workstations can take up more than one tile. They showed off the UI for them in a blog post. You may question why bother, but it's about making a system that allows for easy creation for both the devs and modders. There will be a whole system to machines and connecting them together. The basic idea is modularity. There may be several ways to power a machine and they should all work. This includes scrapping a machine for its parts and reasonably using those parts in another machine. Note that this is something meant for engineering and electronics, which I guess will be a revamped playstyle from the old electrical skill. The devs showed off a very factorial-like example as to what the system could do if modders were to really flex on it. What we will likely see is way more realistic things, like wiring up buildings and plumbing to work with machines. Items in general and the ones you create will have their own stats that are inherited into anything else you make with them. The creator's skill level will be taken into account when generating those stats. One of the challenges with this is the UI for the crafting system. There's too much stuff to use the old UI, even if you ignore the newer features, such as tools increasing item quality or success chance. There's two ideas here. First of all, you can break a specific part of an item, such as a handle on an axe, and that part can be replaced or repaired, allowing for reuse of the pieces. The second idea is that you would be able to remove a piece and it would not be a new item like it currently works in Build 41. They go over this in Migration vs. Craft. The stats of a shotgun carry over into a shotgun trap created by the player. Then, after the trap has been used several times, when the player retrieves the shotgun, its condition has been inherited to match its usage. This sets up an engaging mechanic where you want the best person to create each individual part of an item so that they can be used as many times as possible before they eventually become too damaged to repair, which allows for specialization in trade as they discuss multi-step crafting requiring different professionals if you want the best outcome. This will make more sense after I cover the profession rebounds, but solo players will be able to turn off any multi-person requirements that crafting has. So when it comes to something like an ax, you will want the best blacksmith to make the head and the best woodworker to make the handle. Of course, you will want to give them the best materials to do it with as well. When the head needs sharpened, you may even want to take it to someone who's the best at that. Even more importantly, just because something breaks does not mean it's lost all value. Large enough broken handles will become a club when in use and can be carved down into a smaller handle. A worn out spearhead can be recycled into a smaller blade. Spears themselves have been rebalanced now that the system allows for them to be more spear-like. The theme of the system is still a work in progress. Any part of it could be removed if it is deemed too tedious, for example. It's all about sensible crafting requirements. Currently, you can do almost anything perfectly while standing with the correct tools as long as you have the skill required. They want to add the need for crafting tables and other hard surfaces to work on when doing hand crafting that is a little beyond basic. The example of making a sandwich or spiked bat needing a table or counter as a crafting surface was given. Hopefully they remember that we are all standing on the world's largest table since swimming isn't in the game yet. Particularly, roads and sidewalks are a flattish, hard surface that could easily be used while crouch or sitting. They'll also last decades without use. Mind, it'll be nasty to cut up meat on the ground. I hope you brought a plate. I only point that out because some recipe requirements could feel way too arbitrary and gamey. It heavily hinges on what the etc. part of that statement means. In the blog Slay Ride, they show off a ton of crafting tables and some primitive ones as well. So clearly a large rock or stump counts, and the real question will be down to the specific recipes themselves making sense, which they do promise. That being said, it's exactly as they say. This will be a massive difference when it comes to crafting, and a much needed one at that. I've played enough survival games where you can't make anything beyond the most basic tools without a crafting table. I don't think it'll be an issue as much as a meme like eating a chocolate bar without a table causing sadness in RimWorld. Since everything is being made with modding in mind, I'd bet modders instantly release their own fixed version of the crafting recipes anyway. I mentioned blacksmithing earlier, but we've also seen brewing, pottery, stoneworking, and what is obviously lather working. You can assume all of the existing skills such as tailoring will carry over into Build 42 as well. Coming with Build 42 is likely going to be a full rebalance of traits, skills, and professions. I'll start with professions since I've already mentioned them several times. There will be two sets of professions where it makes sense. The modern professions, such as Metalworker, and the post-apocalyptic versions, such as the Blacksmith. As time passes on a save, character creation will start to switch over from modern jobs to post-apocalyptic ones. The farmer will not go away as it encompasses both ages, although it might start with different recipes unlocked as time goes by, and maybe even different affinities, if only to combat the UI issues having thousands of recipes will cause. I'll talk about UI more later, but they do talk about bringing in a proper UI middleware post Build 42. 
Affinities will be a soft cap on skills that a profession does not specialize in. This is meant to encourage working together with others while allowing a profession to be much better at its intended purposes without grinding if they invest into it. As Zomboid stands currently, the players who can play and survive the longest are eventually the best at everything. This is a design decision to make that less of an issue, and as usual, there will be a sandbox option to turn it off. The other design decision that they've mentioned is exactly how recipes are unlocked. Right now, you either start with them or learn them by reading magazines. However, it's not the greatest system, and reading books only to proceed to grind out the same action over and over till you level up to use the recipe is even worse. This is something I've personally messed around with a ton, even going so far as to create and test a mod that removes skill books and recipe magazines. The devs agree with this in Crafting Rambles. They discuss how they are still figuring out a way to approach the problem. Until NPCs are added, there would be no way to learn recipes or grind out skills if books did not exist, which with the ultimate goal of the crafting system being a fresh start from nothing, they will not. One idea they put out is linking recipes and professions that share common skills or concepts together, allowing characters a head start at performing crafting when they have picked up relevant experience in similar areas elsewhere. So imagine a carpenter being better at metalworking than a nobody because he's used to swinging a hammer or thinking structurally. All right, it's ramble time. Personally, I hope they completely give up on the skill book multipliers. As viewers have noticed, I play old school RuneScape on and off. RuneScape is the ultimate grinding simulator and even it does not have temporary experience gain boost. Literally just the act of reading a multiplayer Zomboid is a massive chore, especially if the admin switches over to two hour days without realizing they just doubled the real life time it takes to read a book. Do you actually want to spend an hour AFK reading in Zomboid? No, you don't. In OSRS, you can level from 1 to 99 in every skill. For outliers, this can take over 100 hours to get a single skill to max. Some of the skills are well balanced, with a new thing to do every few levels and improvements to old methods sprinkled in between. Other skills like blacksmithing have so many recipes that by the end, a ton of recipes get dumped on you as they clearly ran out of levels. Finally, a few skills are just barren wastelands with like 5 useful abilities spread out over the 99 levels. Project Zomboid swings between barren wastelands, such as tailoring, and massive recipe dumping like carpentry. Part of the problem is that 10 levels is just not enough to evenly spread 20 to 30 recipes out in a way that feels like meaningful progression, especially since most skills do not gain anything of use past level 7. Remember, in build 42 there may be hundreds of recipes per skill. The other half is the insane grind some skills require. I hope that any stone can find a way around this. If I had to fix it, I'd recommend a mixture of increasing the amount of skill levels and using the milestone system of leveling up that Dungeons and Dragons groups use. Imagine if you had 10 skill levels, but each individual level was broken up into 10 milestones you had to complete, in any order, to progress to the next level. Each milestone can unlock new recipes and improve your ability at existing ones. Even if it's a 1% quality gain per milestone, that would mean a level 10 carpenter makes better crappy level 1 handles than a profession with zero carpentry knowledge who knows that recipe because it would be insane if everyone couldn't make at least a crappy handle. The most important part of a milestone system is the flexibility. You can change some milestones with every new character as long as they make sense within the tech tree. Bob could be building a whole bedroom set as milestones in order to level up at level 4 carpentry, and Jim, who is also at level 4 carpentry, could have a completely different set of milestones. Maybe he could be making walls, windows, stairs, and floors in order to improve his carpentry skill. Not only would this increase replayability, but it would help with the issue of everyone doing the same thing to level up that current Zomboid has. It would even force cooperation later on as the ability to scavenge existing parts fades away. If you need a door hinge 100 years later, you might need to find a blacksmith. Ramble over, and yes, if anyone wants to use that idea, go ahead. The final part of the rebalance is traits, giving professions stronger unique traits so they are the clear winner at their job and so the existing traits make much more sense. Although smoker fans out there can rejoice knowing that cigarettes will be able to be lit on things other than lighters and matches in vanilla build 42. There may even be an alternative to them. Many other traits have been mentioned. Short-sighted characters who lose their glasses suffer a vision debuff. Illiterate characters will no longer be able to read or write player-generated notes on paper and maps, read text on annotated maps, or the nutritional information on packaged food. I do wonder if being illiterate will remove your ability to use any other traits, much in the same way taking Brave prevents you from choosing other panic-related traits. In theory, some modern professions should remove illiterate from their trait choices. I know we make jokes about doctor's handwriting, but you aren't getting far if you can't read. At least not in the modern world. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but will the pre-apocalypse doctor have significantly better treatments compared to the many years later not doctor? The difference between well-studied knowledge and word-of-mouth knowledge over time could be significant, particularly if no books exist. 
Also, I do hope they look into making more traits that are both positive and negative, like Speed Demon. It's way more interesting to have a set cost than let you figure out which negative trait is free points in order to ultra min max your build. There's nothing quite like everyone having the same five negative traits. Now that I'm theorizing, it's time to move on to my favorite part of this update, the engine improvements. I can't wait for the performance fixes. There's nothing that hurts more than the art style of the game, leading you to believe it'll be really light, only to realize that it's the exact opposite. 2D sprite-based games have huge issues with optimization. The Indie Stone will be fixing that. Step one of it is caching a lot of the visuals to save processing when possible. Note that this caching is not just benefiting your FPS, in which they have showed off massive gains, but will allow them to do other things, such as better highlighting for containers. There is one drawback though. They don't know if the caching will help out on integrated GPUs. If it makes frame rates worse, there will be a fallback to the old system for those who suffer. Step two is a death buffer. This makes it possible for a lot of fake 3D shenanigans to occur. Sitting on furniture is an obvious usage but other things will be included, such as doors properly opening and closing. I was a little skeptical of furniture usage until they showed off a new system allowing for the player to clip through fake 3D 2D structures, like stairs. It's close enough to 3D that I bet they can make the animations feel grounded. I'm hopeful they will add swimming since they can now hide the player behind waves, particularly since a randomized river or stream might be blocking your path. Even if it's just wading across a stream, being forced to do so in winter will be its own challenge. These two changes have caused a waterfall of others, some because they no longer work properly and others because they now can. The view cone has been significantly changed to something much more modern looking. I kind of hope they include a way to turn it off in the sandbox options while still allowing walls and such to block your view. It's a more casual but still fun way to play. It also leads to much better footage for videos and streams, but that's my YouTuber bias talking. They updated the grass to take advantage of the fake 3D as well. It looks so much better and I'm not even talking about the fixed clipping. The old grass just has this TV static look to it. Hopefully they change the old grass ground texture to match the new look, as it also suffers from the TV static. Another welcome change is significantly improving lighting. It's not ray tracing tier. Instead, it's grounding the lighting in a much more realistic way. Interior rooms will no longer be generating their own light, for example. On the other hand, it seems they are favoring a non-pitch black look when it gets really dark. Personally, I want it to be pitch black when there are no light sources but I fully understand why they'd go with a blue color instead. It's a gameplay issue if someone runs out of battery and can no longer do anything. Sometimes realism isn't the answer, although they did mention the need for light to read coming in build 42. The lighting update will be really handy because they are adding proper basements into the game. Actually, they're adding more Z-axis floors, which lets them create skyscrapers and basements. Some places can have really deep basements while others really tall skyscrapers. They also briefly showed off cars going up and down ramps, although they specifically stated it's a very work in progress thing and may not be included in any initial releases. Something really fun about basements will be the randomness. While some buildings will always have the same basement attached to it, other buildings will simply have a basement attachment point that randomly chooses a basement upon world creation. This means you'll never quite know what you're going to find when you discover a basement in a random house, whether it's a bunker, panic room, or other lore event. Another engine upgrade is procedural wilderness. The main map is not going to be procedural. They do, however, talk about making the edges of the map spawn procedural wilderness. This will ease the immersion break that is the black wall the current edges of the map creates, but also allows for players to explore much farther out into the procedurally generated wilderness biomes. Modders will likely have the ability to make randomized towns and road networks out there as well. Yes, I skipped right past biomes. It's been created by a Minecraft dev they hired on, but don't expect crazy things going on out there in the main game. They did throw out the idea of a different map that has unsensible biomes in the future. Personally, I would love to see what the modders do with it, as a wilderness with ancient runes is my perfect dream for a Stone Age type start. If you've ever played Vintage Story, that's the kind of thing I want. Animations have also been improved as discussed in Departments of the Damned. Basically, everything will look and feel smoother, possibly with some control improvements. One thing mentioned is making it so we can rebind the mouse keys. The zombie hordes might be optimized with some animation tech, which will let them put a few more on screen if it works out. Oh yeah, there's a possibility of ragdolls coming to the game as well. There's two final engine updates that have been discussed. A better dynamic music system and character sounds. That's right, now your character will make noises other than that scream when they get dragged down. Wheezes, gasps, grunts, and all sorts of other noises will come from your character as you smash your way through the hordes. Don't worry, they will include an option to turn their frequency up, down, or completely off. The next time you hit character creation, you will have four male and female voices to choose from. This is one of those immersion things that you don't know you're missing until you have it. Speaking of immersion, the dynamic music system will now react to more than just zombies. 
The goal is to have it reacting to loot, special buildings, and other things that may lead to a high note in your survival. Will it be immersive if you hear special music before you realize you were looking at something special? Or is it more the case that your character noticed and the music is there to help you as a player? Just something to think about. They've confirmed 50 songs so far, and holy crap, you need to watch the camping video in the Skillful Huntsman blog. The ambient sounds and the Elder Scrolls-esque music hits the ball out of the park when it comes to the woods feeling. It's dark and even a scary stinger sneaks into the music at the end, which sounds a lot more recognizable as a Zomboid song. I'm talking about dynamic music, but I gotta sneak in that a ton of work is being done to ambient sounds, and it really shows in their teasers. Honestly, the only thing that detracts from the camping video is the old vision cone. I really do hope turning out the vision cone is a thing in the sandbox options. You will also notice they are using a recurring character in these teaser clubs, a character who I automatically like because they use a bat and that's my favorite weapon. Another game system change will be more immersive item spawns. This will come in the form of more realistic scenario and lore based events. Keys will no longer spawn on any zombie that dies in a building. Instead, they will realistically spawn in containers or specific zombies with good reason to have them. More houses will have themes. Some of them will clearly have been inhabited by a specific profession. Flavor books in the house might have lore reasons to be there if you pay attention. You will be able to pick up flyers that advertise a business and that place will be revealed on your map. Note the UI for said flyers is new and as flexible as possible for the modders. The already existing professional vehicles will be made more apparent so you can easily find necessary loot. Sometimes you'll come across a place that has already been looted with items strewn about the floor. They also talk about bottleneck items and reducing their rarity with more immersive spawns. Can openers and a keyring can opener are mentioned and we will be able to open canned food with a knife at some risk to our hands. The corkscrew will have its uses as well. Expect to find bottleneck items in cars and various other places they normally did not spawn. Particularly, any event such as annotated maps and randomized stories have had their loot tables revised. It's more than that though. With this update comes a reasonable expectation to craft anything you should be able to craft as a survivor. The devs have been busy making way more items. Some of these items will be set dressing, while others will have functions. If you really examine the screenshots in their blogs, you'll notice tons of them sitting around. We've seen scuba gear, all sorts of tools, lots of cowboy themed items as a western set piece is being added to the map, working backpack radios, canteens, military webbing that uses the fanny pack slot, and more. We've seen references to plate armor, but mostly just pictures of asymmetric Mad Max style armor. I started to wonder if we will get to equip individual shin guards for each leg, or if they come in pairs, and then I found a quote for it, with a lovely mention of making sure they spawn in pairs. With the whole surviving in the woods theme, they added a full-on modern camping set and appropriate Stone Age camping gear as well. Oh, and to really make people happy, working masks, including the ability to make new filters. The list of new items goes on and on, it's ridiculous. Beware, you might actually need that mask, as a video clip showing them off also mentions bodies causing poisonous gas indoors. That would be a change from the current corpse sickness mechanic, which is much more forgiving. A house that has been left full of bodies may turn into a no-go zone. Something really fun about these face covering masks is the implications in multiplayer. In Leapdoid, the devs discuss face coverings acting as a disguise that hides your name as part of a multiplayer revamp. Another role-playing add-on, mostly for the admins, is an extension of Discord integrations. You could already combine chat from Discord in the server, but now they can trigger pre-made scripts and such from Discord on the server. This will smooth out the event process for those active admins. Speaking of multiplayer, a ton of work has been occurring. Most of it has been removing the reliance on client-side authority for inventories. I do hope this helps with weapon-bearing zombies sometimes losing their loot because a different player who did not see the weapon killed the zombie. There's other things getting polished up as well. PvP animations and combat logging has been named, as well as improving character sync between players. Lastly, exploits against safe houses was called out on their to-do list. The mention of anti-cheat worries me. I think any effort going into it is wasted, unless it's also helping with other issues, such as the inventory being moved to server side. Cheaters will always find ways to ruin things, and I personally think whitelisted servers are the way forward for every game, not just Project Zomboid. There's a reason PvP games are starting to make separate cheater queues, if only to stall them before they realize they've been had. Guns are getting a massive overhaul. Basically, everything that people acted like guns did will now be in the game. Panic will affect accuracy. Anything that affects hit chance will affect critical chance. Distance to target will matter more when it comes to those debuffs. And even more gloriously, weather will finally matter too. Wind, rain, fog, and how dark it is will all screw you over as the horde relentlessly comes for you. Flashlights will help those forced to fight in the dark. While this looks like an overall nerf, they do mention buffing hit chances in general at lower skill levels. 
Probably the best part on the buff side is sights on guns being ignored if aiming without the sight has a better hit chance. You can finally use that 8x scope up close. There's more changes, so I've left them on screen this whole time. I'll be moving on to a more general section of updates and improvements. The devs stated they will focus on keeping consistent animations and UI between all the new systems. There will be a redesign of the sandbox menu, as well as a proper mod manager, including the ability to change load orders and share presets with other players. Mods will be getting a version tag system to make sure you know you are trying to use a Build 41 mod on Build 42 before you start yelling about it being broken. They'll be fixing the issue of different mods having the same idea as well. Finally, for modding, they discussed the stretch goal of a new modding API and guide. Don't expect that anytime soon. Another UI add-on is one of their own creation. It's meant to make readable materials much easier to create and translate. You'll find it being used on flyers and such. Do read those, as they will reveal good places to loot on your map. Those of us with very high resolution monitors can rejoice as the UI has been reworked to be properly sized at 4K. No, as far as I can tell, it's still a drop down window setting and not a slider for UI size. A bit of a disappointment, but that will probably come when they add in a proper UI middleware later. My background footage is probably gameplay in 4K, so you can look at that if you want to know exactly what I suffer from. Reading will no longer cause a player to eat books. Instead, it'll start a cooldown before you can enjoy it again. I think I'll miss the jokes on that little zomboid mechanic. Along those same realistic lines, you'll be able to destroy the clutter items like boulders and stumps for the correct resources. Something a lot of players have pointed out is ridiculous with foraging. Not being able to pick up the obvious rock on the ground can be infuriating. Cleaning up will also become normal inside buildings, with the ability to wipe off the years of grime as long as you have the correct tools for the job. Spiky armor is a thing now. They showed it off by having a player push spike wearing zombies barehanded and receiving injuries. New PvP meta, I guess. While that might scare you, the real scare is a new fence mechanic. You know those tall fences that completely block zombies? Well, a big enough horde will eventually push them over. As usual, it'll have a sandbox option for you to tweak. That brings me to the last and most questionable part of Build 42, fires. At the beginning of their foray into Build 42, they showed off some work in progress clips of a new fire appearance, as well as mentioning they don't know if it will make it into Build 42. Those newer clips are gone, and even more recently, we've seen the old fire in a video. The last time the fire rework was mentioned is in Cellar Door Droid, and that confirms it's on a back burner for now. I suspect the new fire appearance may have been dropped from at least the beta release of Build 42. That being said, all we see is the old fire graphic. That doesn't mean the majority of the new mechanics they discussed are gone, as most of those do not require an appearance change to work. Honestly, I love the old cartoony fire, so it's not a big deal to me. It would be nice if it actually spread realistically though. Who knows, there's still time for it to resurface in yet another monthly dev blog. Now that I've gone through everything we can reasonably expect, how far along is Build 42? Well, this is a bit of an unknown. In the blog Disruption Week, they lay out exactly what's going into Build 42. And the tech upgrade is assumed to be the one that will take the longest before it can be integrated. In the blog titled, hmm, upgrades, we get confirmation that the tech upgrades have finally been merged. But there is one final Build 42 element that has not been merged yet. Later on, it's pretty much confirmed it's the crafting system. Hell, the roadmap that discusses splitting the dev team into two groups with one focusing on NPCs for future builds and then moves on to talk about design ideas for what will be in Build 42 was posted on January 6, 2022. If we do the meme thing of assuming Build 42 full release will come out on the last day of the year, we could be a handful of days off of three years from the first serious Build 42 talks to final release. I'm pretty sure this is the first blog post that concretely announces work on the next builds of the game. Just listen to the quote. Going forward, now the behemoth that is Build 41 is increasingly looking to be in our rear view mirror. We are going to structure the internal game's development into two distinct teams." End quote. One of these teams would be working on NPCs and the other would work on many things including what we know as Build 42. Now obviously the last Build 41 patch occurred in November 2022, and the last hotfix in December. So really it'll be two years between updates at most. That being said, there have been two developer posts that give vague but concrete answers. On Reddit, Lemmy, the lead developer of Project Zomboid, stated first half of 2024 at least for public beta. Note, this was posted in 2023, so I edited that statement a bit to make sense. Look at the quote on screen if you want the exact wording and context. The context matters. The second concrete post is the Indie Stone account stating the end of 2024 for Build 42 release. I assume that is meant to be the full release of Build 42, so we could have the public beta in a few months and full release by the end of the year. While I'll remain positive, I'd probably stick to the latest possible date for each of those, if not expecting a delay. 
The Indie Stone has moved fairly slowly in the past, although now that they have hired a ton of new developers, you can see the massive increase in the size of the update. Certain systems and circumstances delayed the update, which allowed for many more things to keep getting squeezed in. The influence of these new employees is twofold, not only from their own work experience, but also in the way Indie Stone is managed. We saw this with the end of the Build 41 updates. Yeah, there were and still are a ton of bugs in Build 41. But the decision to move on to exclusive Build 42 work was partly due to needing to keep the new employees fed with projects to work on. If all the coders are fixing bugs, they can't exactly be making the systems the rest of the team need to design around. I finally made it to the end. If you're still here and listening, you can sometimes catch me streaming on Twitch. That's all. Peace out, folks.